So let me introduce you all to Mr. Kishan Ramcharan. He's a forester one with the forestry division, right? And Kishan is also a past student of Rio Claro, right? You, you went to junior sec, right? Yep. Right, so he actually came to school here, right? And then he went on to the college next door when it was still junior and senior. Unfortunately, um, we are in the hall because of distancing and the lighting on your presentation is a little off because it plays bright now, but go ahead nevertheless. All right, good morning, everybody. I don't know if I could get uh, feedback from everyone. I thought I'll be able to hear everybody, but uh, my name is Kishan Ramchan. I'm a forester one at the forestry division. I belong to the community forestry and forestry information unit of the division. So our main purpose of that unit is to educate and sensitize the public schools community groups on the importance of forests and you know the benefits that forests provide for us and why we need to protect it and manage it properly so the forestry division manages the forest which is the largest living natural resource that we have in trinidad and we are blessed to be a part of a, a system that has that type of forest as compared to other caribbean countries other countries around the world because we have a vast amount of, and I'm going to use a big word, biodiversity, right? Some of you all may have heard about it already, seen that there's the geography class and agriculture class. Biodiversity basically means plants and animals, simple as that. So when I was in your days in school there, right there in Rio Claro, I was uh, introduced to agriculture. And that is what led me to become a forester one in the forestry division. So my advice at that point in time is to, if you enjoy that type of work and that type of studying, this is the job for you. This is one of the main, main um, jobs that you could get in the Ministry of Agriculture as a forester one, and you could also be an agricultural officer. So it's really my pleasure to be here to present to you all on our forests of Trinidad. And today our main highlight is World Wetlands Day, right? So I have a nice slideshow pre prepared for you all, right? And I hope you all can see it. Um, Derek, you can let me know if you're seeing it here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, wow. All right, so today we celebrate World Wetlands Day. All right, today is February 2nd. So around the world every year, people celebrate this day to show the importance of wetlands and why wetlands are important. So I'm using the word wetlands and you may be wondering, what am I talking about? So this slide would basically explain what wetlands are, which is the sole purpose of what we are having this lecture about today. Usually, the forestry division would have had a physical exhibition where we invite schools to visit and see different types. We create models of wetlands. We actually sometimes carry schools into wetland areas like uh, Nariva Swamp and Karani Swamp. And we do tours and so on during this time. But seeing that we are under COVID restrictions and the coronavirus is out there, we have to resort to this. And well, we make do with it. All right, so let's go on. So this is our logo for the forestry division here. So you can identify a forest officer or forestry worker with this logo right below here. And I actually have it on my jersey as well. So this year, every year they do a different poster highlighting what uh, the theme for the wetlands are. Right, and this year our wetland team is Wetlands Action for People and Nature. I repeat it again: Wetlands Action for People and Nature. All right, so again, we are hearing the word wetlands, and we want to know what it is really. So we are fo focusing on valuing, managing, restoring, and loving our wetlands because they play a very vital and integral role in our survival, and also maintain our daily, daily living, as you can see. 
So we ask the question, what are wetlands? You all are seeing a nice type of specific tree here. This tree is actually called a mangrove. And I know some of you all who have been to crab catching, some of you have visited wetlands such as Carney Swamp, the River Swamp, would have seen these very beautiful specific types of trees that have a certain purpose. Right? These mangroves serve a whole variety of different services for wetlands. This tree that you're seeing here, those are roots below, and these are prop roots from a red mangrove tree, right? And you would notice that these roots are above the water, right? And they actually provide a home for fishes and for different types of aquatic life. So that again is a, 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 a service of the wetlands and mangroves in wetlands, providing a, providing a very nice safe habitat for fishes and for different aquatic habitats, aquatic animals. So what are wetlands? Wetlands are areas of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural, artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing. So we have water either remaining stagnant in an area or it can be flowing based on the tide or if we have water flowing through that area. So it can be fresh, brackish or salt water. So we are familiar with fresh water. We are familiar with salt water. Brackish water is basically a mixture of two, where we have the salt water meeting the fresh water. And this is where it combines for certain types of aquatic life to live in, right? And this is basically an area and a depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. So our team for World Wetland, they basically is particularly pertinent to Trinidad concerning the livelihood opportunities that are provided by the country's three Ramsar sites. So a Ramsar site is an area that was specified for the protection of wetlands, right? And it was an agreement that was done worldwide in every different country has certain areas that are wetlands that need to be, what we can say, protected, right? To ensure it's its survival, it's sure that the species that thrive there are protected. So we have three main sites in Trinidad and Tobago, or three main wetlands, the Carney Swamp, the River Swamp, and the Buco, Buco Reef or Bonacorn Lagoon Complex, right? As we said, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, it's a waterfall habitat. So this is an international treaty Right, to make sure we sustainably use and we conserve what we have in the wetlands of Trinidad and Tobago and around the world. So this map here shows you where these major wetlands are. And this is a map, as you can see, Carney Swamp. For those of you who have had visited the Carney Swamp, well, it's located in the Carney area just after you pass Charlieville and you're heading up to the north side on the highway. Right, it's on the left-hand side there. And people do a lot of tours and operations in that area. And they carry a lot of tourists and even locals to see our national bird, which is the scarlet ibis, inside of the Carney Swamp that roosts there. We also have the Nariva Swamp, which is located on the Manzanella stretch. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been to the Manzanella Beach, hopefully. Seeing that you all are from Rio Claro, you should be familiar with that. So the Nariva Swamp is located just adjacent or opposite to the Manzanilla beach itself. And you'll notice that there are certain types of vegetation that could show you exactly where the Nariva swamp is. And we're gonna to touch about a little bit about that further on. We also have in Tobago, I'm sure, hopefully some of you all have been able to visit the Buco Reef. Now the Buco Reef is actually another major tourist destination site because of the types of vegetation, the cleanliness of the water in the sea there, right? And the Bonacord Lagoon is located in that major area. So it's a Bonacord wetland, as you can see, that's the name of it. So this is where the Nariva Swamp is located here. This is the Manzanilla Beach, and directly opposite is where that swamp area will go down straight, down to be bordering Plumita and Mayaru. And in Bonacord, right, it's not too far from where you'd go to Pigeon Point, which is the another major beach and destination point for tourists. 
right? So from Pigeon Point and from, from that area there, you can take a boat, hire a boat, and go out into the Buco Reef and also visit the Bonacord Lagoon, where we have No Man's Land and all these different other places around that area that you can visit. So you all will be seeing a lot of more photos to, hide, to help identify these areas. Good. So we have different types of wetlands. So this really, very beautiful picture that you all are seeing here is an overhead drone, shot, drone footage or shot of an estuarine wetland. So it's a very funny name, estuarine, right? We have, this would include deltas, tidal marshes, and mangrove swamps. So uh, an example of an estuarine is the Carney Swamp, right? And there are certain types of vegetation that you would find in the Carney Swamp, right? So we'd have the type, different types of mangroves, and there are three major types of mangroves. They are the red mangrove, which is the photo that you all saw before, the white mangrove, the black mangrove. There's also a mangrove called the button mangrove. So this area is laden with those types of mangroves, and this creates a very unique ecosystem. And these mangroves, where these estuarine uh, wetlands are located, start from the coastline. And these mangroves protect us from you know, the storm surges, from these tidal waves that may come in, or tidal surges as they call them. So this would be a buffer zone from stopping. Maybe if we do have uh, to brace for a tsunami, these are the vegetations that would brace the impact of that. So it's good to have these along our coastline. Our mangroves are also important because this is where our national bird nests, which is what we call the scarlet ibis one of our national birds. The other bird, as we would know, is the Kokriko, which is found in, the, in our Tobago itself. All right, another type, of veget uh, another type of wetland that we would have is the marine wetland, right? And this wetland is a coastal wetland that's, that includes rocky shores and coral reefs. So we're we'll explaining about the Boko Reef, and this is actually a, a really nice photo and I believe this was taken last two years. Um, I believe this was from a boat that actually carries you to a tour there. And the nylon pool is actually part of the Boko Reef there, Boko Reef area. So these dark areas that you're seeing here are where there'll be a lot of, a lot of uh, corals that people would come to snorkel and, and see. So corals are one of the main types of vegetation life an aquatic life that we would find here. Also, we have seagrass beds that are found uh, below, below that area there in the actual seabed that where fishes and so on would breed. And this is a home for where these fishes can live in. Also, we have sargassum or seagrass. So I know some of you all may be I didn't, I'm able to identify what uh, the sargassum or seaweeds. Right? When we go to the beaches, these are some of the things that will wash up. The seagrass right? and the seaweeds. This is a darkish green leafy substance that comes from the sea itself. Right? So these are what we would find uh, as a type of vegetation in a marine wetland. Another type of wetland, and this is a very unique one, is lacustrine. Right? Lacustrine our wetlands are associated with lakes and it's bordered by vegetation. And this one is actually a really nice drone footage of a salt pond in Shaka Shakari. So Shaka Shakari is one of the islands of Trinidad and Tobago, one of our small islands. Um, you all have heard of the term five island. We have the water park named after that. All right, this is one of the islands there. Now a salt pond, uh, is very unique where we have salt water trapped in an area there in a pond in that island. So it's so unique that we have specific types of veg vegetation. So this pond is bordered with mangrove, as what we explained earlier. We have manchineel, which can also be found in Tobago on the coastline. Manchineel is actually a very, very toxic uh, poisonous tree that we try to educate people on. There is a toxin that exudates from the leaves that can be harmful to your skin, right? It can be poisonous to that. 
So we try to stay away from sheltering under these mansion hill trees because if rain sometimes falls from that, it can it can um, drip on our skins and that can be very bad for us. Right? And it can cause some serious irritation. And there's a small green fruit that we should not even pick from that tree as well. So we have that type of vegetation there. Right? And there's also a type of cotton called the sea island cotton that also is one of the vegetations found in this type of salt pond here in Shaka Shakari. So maybe when you all when we all get a chance, we can visit this area here and hike to it. A lot of people do tours to this area. So it's also a nice tourist destination. So wetlands, as we hear the word tourist destination, because of the, the uniqueness of these wetlands, it attracts people because of the type of plants, vegetation, and wildlife, marine life, and biodiversity. So wetlands encourage tourism. Another major type of wetland that we have are palustrine, meaning marshy or marshy swamp. I know a lot of you like to catch crabs. Some of you all like to eat crab and dumpling and so on. All right, I like to catch crabs. Can find some of these crabs in these types of wetlands as well. You can also find crabs in the estuarine, right? But also in the in the palustrine, you would find crabs in here too. All right. So these marshy swamps have a certain type of vegetation. And an example of that type of swamp in Trinidad is the Nariva swamp, as we explained in the Manzanilla area. So some of the vegetation, the specific types of vegetation you'll find there are palms, and there are different types of palms, the Maurice palm, royal palm, and the palmese palm. Palmese is a palm that is also edible. The heart of that palm is edible. So some of you all may have tasted that before they, they extract the heart of that palm, right? So it's also called mana. So that's from the palmist palm. The royal palm and the Moorish palms, these are unique, unique tall palms that we would find our blue and gold macaws nesting in and also different types of parrots like to nest in these palms because of how tall it is and safe and it also has the fruit from these palms that they also eat. And they make their nest inside of these palm trees. So when the palm trees die, the head of the palm trees may fall off and the bark and the trunk is exposed where they would dig themselves into these bark itself and make their nests. So this is a, a habitat for a lot of birds, a lot of animals, especially the palestrine has a wide amount of biodiversity. So the Nariva swamp is rich in biodiversity. And if you look at this photo here, you will see different types of lilies, also reeds and sedges that live in this. And we also have forest trees that make up this, to this type of ecosystem. And one of the types of trees that you would find here are the bloodwood, uh, which has uh, buttress barks, like the silk cotton trees found in that vegetation there. Buttress meaning it's a, it's a long type of root, buttress root, sorry, right? So it's an area, a habitat for animals to live in, like they are goatee, and so on, I'd like to find a home in these types of root systems. So marshy meaning there's a lot of water saturated in the soil. So if you try to step into those areas, you'll go down into a lot of waterlogged areas. So this is palestrine wetlands. And then another type of wetland is the riverine, where wetlands are found along rivers and streams. Riverine wetlands have different types of vegetation, specific types of vegetation as well, like water hyacinths and lilies. So this photo is actually a nice, a nice image of a riverine wetland. And I believe this one was found in the fishing pond area. And this riverine wetland has lilies here. And you can see these lilies are very unique, right? They look like bowls that are floating above the water. And you'll find a lot of insects making their homes on top of these frogs, right? And also different types of uh, fishes would lay their eggs under these lily pads or use these lily pads as protection from birds that may want to come and pick down at them. So this is a riverine type wetland. And one of the last types of wetlands that we'll be talking about today are man-made wetlands. 
Uh, these can be in the form of reservoirs, farm ponds, irrigated, irrigated agricultural lands that have collected water, canals, gravel pits, fish and shrimp ponds. So we have a lot of irrigated agricultural lands in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm sure right opposite the Carney Swamp area, if you're going down the highway there, you'll see a lot of the rice lands that are filled with water, right? And this has formed a, a man-made wetland, as you'll see. And we have three main reservoirs in Trinidad and Tobago, or dams. And one main one that uh, is located close to the Rio Claro area is the Nave Dam. Some of you all may live in that area. These reservoirs are what WASA would use. WASA is the Water and Sewage Authority that provides water to us. They would use this water, filter it, and bring it to our taps. And these wetlands have to be located in a forested area. So you see how important forests are. Forests protect these wetlands and ensure that the water is always present in, in these wetlands because of the groundwater storage and how cool the area is. You wouldn't find a wetland in the middle of San Fernando or Port of Spain. Has to be located in a forested area, right? These wet man-made wetlands. So this is actually an example of the Arena Dam, which is located uh, close to the Kumoto area, right? And this is where Wasa would take their water from to provide for the northern area of Trinidad and Tobago, right? And the central area of Trinidad and Tobago. So we have the, also the Hollis Reservoir, which is another dam that we have, right? And so we have Navet, Hollis, right? Or the Hollis Dam, right? We also have the Arena Dam, which are, which are man-made wetlands. And in Tobago, we have the Hillsborough Dam. So all these are man-made wetlands and we have specific types of vegetation growing there, like the cabbage lilies. And fishes like to feed on these cabbage lilies. And also we have different types of aquatic species that would feed in that. We have the river otters and so on that frequent these areas. And speaking of river otters, there are river otters found right there in Rio Claro. There was a video circulating that I actually shared last year on social media where river otters were spotted in the river right by where B. Rampisoon's hardware is right there in Rio Claro. There's a river right there. Yep, and it was spotted by someone while walking right across the bridge there. So we have different aquatic species, a lot of wildlife in these areas. And they would, they would stem off and swim down into small streams. And this is how we would see them. Good. So this image here looks very scary. This is actually a cascabel snake, right? And it's a type of constrictor that is found in our wetlands. For those of you who had visited the Karani Swamp, this is the snake that they would stop to show you a picture of. And I was very of this um, on my visit to the Karani Swamp. We have tour guide operators like Nanans and Kalpus that can carry you on tours there. And he was perched on a mangrove branch and he would sit there and feed on different types of birds and different types types of amphibians that would be on these branches sitting. So we'd have frogs, we'd have birds, even insects. All right, so this is a cascabel snake. This is not a snake you'd want to fall in the boat. So, you know, we keep a good enough distance so that we can see them. And as we said, wetlands are rich reservoirs of biodiversity, right? 40% of the world's plant and animal species live or breed in wetlands. Over 100,000 freshwater species have been identified in wetlands so far. Coastal wetlands especially are among the most biologically diverse species. Right? Because of the unique of the amount of vegetation this well that you can find there as part of that ecosystem. So these are some of our wetland friends, and I'm sure you all can, can identify this bird that you're seeing here 
is an endangered species. It's the blue and gold macaw. And this is the same macaw that I was talking about that nests in our forests and our wetlands in the Nariva swamp. Right? And throw different parts of Trinidad and Tobago that is forested. I'm sure some of you all may have seen these animals as pets. Of course, you would require a permit to keep these animals as pets. And of course, you all can identify this one during the hunting season. And right now we are in the hunting season, right? So how many of you all know when the hunting season is? The hunting season it starts from the 1st of October to the last day in February. So we just have like one month again for our hunting season to finish, right? So you all are seeing the green iguana here, right? This is one of the hunted species that we have, or game species. We have the red hauler monkey, which is a protected animal, which is found in the river swamp, especially on our southeastern part of Trinidad and Tobago, our forest in that area, Guayaguari forest. But our wetlands are a major, a major home for these species as well. So the Nariva swamp is the home for that red howler monkey. That is one of the two types of monkeys that we have. Two endemic species. The other one being the white-fronted capuchin monkey. We also have the spectacle caiman, which is unique to Trinidad and Tobago. The caiman that is also a hunted species in Trinidad as well. All right, so it's a game species. And it makes its home in these wetland areas because it's an aquatic species as well. So it would make nests close to the water area there. And this is where it will have our babies, have their babies. We have the agouti, also a game species found in our wetlands. All right, so you see how rich our biodiversity is already. We have our wild ducks or waterfowl. And these are actually the black-bellied whistling tree duck which is a very unique species found here, right? And they are very well equip equipped to fly as compared to our local farm dogs that we rear. These black-bellied whistling tree dogs are really unique and really nice. We also have other species of waterfowl that can be found in our wetlands. So wetlands are home for these waterfowls as well. And then we have another endangered species. Have just a few of these remain cow. Now the manatee or the sea cow, uh, as we said, is endangered. All right, and it's found in our wetlands as well. And of in the Karani swamp, and you all can see its color is really beautiful because it feeds off the crabs, right? that live, these fiddler crabs that live in the mangrove as well. So it depends on the mangrove to sustain itself and get that rich color. Good. Wetlands, as we said, support life. And this is actually a really nice image of above and below where you can see the roots submerged in the water and we see it supports fish life, jellyfish. So this is most likely a coral a coral area and we have um, on these roots barnacles and different types of crustaceans that stick on and live off these roots and these are what other aquatic species would feed on and this one is found obviously on the coastline this is a type of mangrove as well so we have white mangroves red mangroves and again black mangroves right so wetlands are really critical to natural environment and play a key role in supporting our identity and they support our water birds fish and amphibians they support roosting nesting and feeding habitats refuge for extreme water conditions and migratory corridors right for different types of birds and aquatic life and here you'd see actually in the carny swamp people utilizing that area to do footage of our biodiversity that we would have to do different types of um, documentaries and this is actually our conservator forest mr denny dip chancing sitting right here having an interview done in the carney swamp and this was uh this was uh carried out 
for, I believe, World Wetlands Day as well last year. So this is how beautiful our swamp can be. All right, and people depend on, wet, on wetlands for different reasons. And we have to learn to manage it properly and sustainably utilize what our resources are in the wetlands, right? So like people like to catch crabs and harvest oysters, you have to know not to over harvest these things. And when we are doing it, do it and make sure that it does not damage the wetlands, right? The products of our wetlands are, are done by tour guides, right? So like we, as we mentioned before, we have nanans and kalpus that make money off of these wetlands at the same time. And this is what we sustain or tourism with or ecotourism, right? So these wetlands are protected by us, the Forestry Division, IME, and other NGOs or non-governmental agencies. So we make sure that these wetlands are managed properly. We make sure that people who are using it are monitored and, and we, are guide, we guide them basically to make sure that it's not damaged and so on. Wetlands are important because it can provide food for us. And I'm sure some of you all may have eaten this type of fish, the cascadura, which are found in our wetlands, especially in the Nariva Swamp, the Kunaham areas, right? Because it provides communities with a source of living. People who like to fish and sell fishes, they make a livelihood out of that. We have agricultural activities taking place in wetlands like rice farming, watermelon and all these areas for those of you all who have been or live in the Kunaham area. That's the scarlet ibis there. And that's actually how it feeds within these wetland areas. So the services of wetlands is control sediment and erosion. They control the flood that happens in an area by filtering the water and reduces the impact of flood and so on and absorb water in our land. So the flooding does not raise the higher level, right? They maintain water quality and abatement of pollution. So they would filter, right? And strain out the pollutants, right? They maintain the maintenance of surface and underground, underground water supply, right? They sustain, as we was talking about man-made man wetlands in that we can have water to drink in our taps. They support fisheries where we can have different types of aquatic life living there and we can harvest that and make a living. Outdoor recreation by visiting our different wetlands through these tour guiding services. Habitat for wetlands, especially waterfowl. And they control the climate as well and reduce you know, global warming by absorbing the amount of um, carbons that we have and so on. As we said, exist. Coral reefs and mangroves shield the coastline, as we said. As you see, they protect the coastlines from different storm surges and even tsunamis. And over 1 billion people around the world make a living from wetlands. They provide tow guiding services, bird watching, fishing and crab harvesting, scientific research, and among other services. Wetlands remove pollutants. So we have wetlands close to, for example, the Point Lisa's industry there, right there in the Coover area. So we have wetlands located in that area, right? Like the Cali Bay Swamp itself and the Orange Valley Mangrove Association. That filters, you know, the water that would stream off from these areas. And again, they attract people for recreation. Some people like to go kayaking, bird watching and that sort of thing. Threats to wetlands, human activities. Wetlands are threatened by man, right? Human activities, wetlands are vanishing three times faster than forests, right? We have invasive species also coming into our wetlands like the capybara, right? Which actually is from the South American mainland, which is one of the largest rodents in the world. And they would destroy our wetland habitats and compete, they would outcompete our prey and native, native species, right? When we pollute our wetlands, it changes the water quality and can also affect the fishes and the aquatic life there, such as oil spills. And this image that you're seeing here is actually someone um, cleaning up our wetlands, right? And this is sometimes the state of our wetlands. And this was actually an Orange Valley 
cleanup campaign that was done because people go into these remote areas and dump their tires and different types of different types of um, trash that can hamper our wetlands. Climate change also affects our wetlands. It can cause our species to stop thriving like our mangroves. And we have climate change taking a major role in affecting our basic weather patterns that we have here. Another threat to wetlands are the overexploitation of the resources. These are when people want to over harvest crabs and other species that they would get off of these wetlands like oysters. Right? And even mangroves, people want to cut the mangrove roots, roots to use it. And if we keep doing that and harvesting and that, then we would cause uh, a bad, bad impact on our wetlands. So this is actually one of the birds, uh, pelicans affected by the oil spins, oil spills in the Cali Bay area on the coastline of Trinidad, of the coastline because of the oil spill that took place. And Forestry Division plays a major role in helping these situations when oil spills takes place. So the impacts of wetland loss, we have a direct loss of species diversity. It kills off a species, right? We can increase the amount of mosquito problems we have. We, they, we can increase sedimentation, cause our rivers to be polluted, right? Which affects pollution. We, do, we can reduce the water supply and water storage, storage in our wetland. We can cause algae to bloom, which is a type of vegetation that is green in the water. Like if you have an aquarium at home and you leave it in the sun and it gets green, imagine we have this happening in our wetlands and that takes up a lot of the oxygen in the water and can cause the fishes to die. And we have a nutrient overload of nitrogen and so on, which can be harmful to wetlands. Right, and it could affect our fishing community. When we have oil spills, we can't eat the fish off the coastlines. So these are some of the impacts when our wetlands are affected. All right, so we have our poster there with our team, Wetlands Action for People and Nature. And we see how, how people impact our wetlands. So we need to re-wet, reforest, and restore wetlands. These are some of the posters that we would use to sensitize the public. All right, we have to stop draining our wetlands and trying to do agriculture, just like in a river swamp. People will try to encroach on it to plant rice and plant watermelons and all these different things. So we have to take into consideration that, right? Wetlands are our biodiversity hotspots. It stores our fresh water, it's carbon sinks for global warming, and it's a source of livelihood for our friends and family, especially, you know, people who like to fish, people who do dog hiding operations. So what can we do seeing as it's, as it's World Wetland Day, right? What can we do to help our wetlands? Recycling, as we always say, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle so that we can restore and revive our wetlands, right? We reuse our plastics. We put our bottles in special bins, in our glass bottles. We try not to throw away plastic bags and all these different things into our, our streams and our rivers on our beaches because it can affect our aquatic life, all right? We need to stop littering, which is a major thing. Right, so that comes to the end of our presentation today. And again, we thank you for listening to us. So I'll take you on back to our presenter. We have uh, Mr. Ramda there. What sir has spoken about will for the form files, we just covered aquaculture and brackish water and fresh water and salt water. So remember that, and he spoke about that, right? And to all of you, I've spoken to you all about the littering and the dumping of the plastics and the not biodegradable stuff into our waterways, right? So he has just re-emphasized the exact same thing that we have been teaching you here in school. And as I told you all, well, those of you who are in my class, Unfortunately, in Trinidad, we have a culture where apparently we don't depend on the rubbish truck. We like to dump. You pass around to certain areas and you see a lot of rubbish in the areas of Mayaro and Rio Claro. A lot of the rivers are filled with um, plastics, cups, and everything, styrofoam, and what have you. And um, 
I know that the Mayaro Rioja Regional Corporation undertook to clean some of these rivers, I think last year. Yeah. Yeah. If you all who are the future of this country do not recognize this and do not put a stop to that practice, we are going to destroy our island. And then uh, by the time your grandchildren get to inherit the, the, um, the country, you will have nothing. So we need to protect our wetlands. And you all need to understand the importance of this. And that is why the um, division has decided to give you this presentation. What I will do is that I'll um, record, well, it's on record. I will post the recording to my class and I will give the recording to Miss so that she could share it back with you all at, at will, right? Is that okay, Mr. Ramtran? That is very fine. If we can get a, a, a footage of, of today's presentation, I would be very well appreciated. I'll send it to you. Great. So I have one last request. I don't know if it's possible that we can see this, the, the school again um, or the class there. Um, I have a pledge that I would like to make them say, which is something I always reiterate with the students. Right. right? So, so I just have one more thing I'd like the students to do. If we can get everybody to stand. All right, this is a nice, a nice little thing here. Right, so I'm going to make you all see a pledge. And hopefully this resonates to you all and to your family members. And you all can take a nice, a nice stretch there as well. So first of all, I'd like everybody to take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. One more time. Breathe in. Deep breaths. Breathe out. Very good. So that what you just took in there is air that is provided from our forest, courtesy of our forest. So you see how important our forests are. Without that, we can't survive. So I want to take, take your right hand and put it up like this. Your right hand. No, your next right hand. Very good. All right, and repeat after me. I promise to do my part in protecting and conserving our forests. All right, give yourself a round of applause there. Okay, sir. So, are we done? <laughs> we are done. We are done. We are actually cutting into their recess time a little bit. So, um, please go ahead and take your chairs back and have your recess for what remains. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, Mr. Ramdat, for having us. You're welcome.